So good morning, everyone. Um, a couple of announcements before starting. Uh, as you may have noticed, the assignment 10 is posted. It was posted on, on Tuesday, as we mentioned, and Francis, I believe he sent an email, but we were having some issues with the, um, again, with our server. So I think um, that email didn't reach you guys, uh, but uh, Francis, you sent another email yesterday. Yeah. So we move uh, the due date. So the due date is going to be next Wednesday at midnight. I think Francis mentioned this again, but uh, there will be a makeup assignment which will be presented on Thursday, a week from now, and it will be open for one week only. So there won't be uh, late submissions accepted. Um, uh, it's mostly for people who has missed an assignment or, or, I mean, it's open for everyone, but I will recommend that, I mean, the people who misses a, an assignment you need to have 10 submissions for, for approving the course. It's one of the conditions. So you need to have 10 submissions um, submitted, 10 assignments submitted. And if you feel that like you could improve a little bit your, your grade by doing this makeup assignment, you are welcome to do it, but bear in mind that we're going to take the best 10 submissions. So it, it only replaces the lowest grade that you have. Um, again, if you have any questions, just feel free to, to uh, to us in the forum or by email, um, but just to let you know a little bit of how it's going to be um, the things with the assignments. Okay. Um, any questions about this or the assignment? Assignment 10 is about MPI. Um, yeah. Please start that? early. Uh, MPI yeah. is, is, is a bit tricky to get going. Um, so I don't want you to get stuck an hour before the deadline and we are asleep <laughs> yeah yeah de definitely don't don't wait until the last minute especially for the mpi part okay yeah. we'll have uh, office hours on monday and wednesday monday and wednesday so they're, uh, they're but you can you can ask questions on the forum before that obviously. yeah but as, as Francis mentioned don't wait until you know wednesday after the office hours to start this assignment uh, as you may have noticed, MPI can be a little bit tricky, convolute, if you wish. So it's good that you guys get, uh, get a head up start. Okay. All right. Any questions? Looks like not. Okay. Okay, team, we have done it. <laughs> well, almost done it. It's, it's the, our last lecture. Um, so let me share. My slides with you. Okay, all right. Um, what we're going to be talking today uh, is what we usually refer to as heterogeneous computing. I believe is in contrast to what you may think is homogeneous computing, which refers to okay on which on which devices, which type of devices you will be. Um, running things. Okay, one second because it's our last class and of course Zoom is hiding my child with. Okay, there we go. And okay, so the plan for today is to talk a little bit about uh, accelerators and when I mean accelerators actually I, I, I would ref be referring mostly to CPUs but also coprocessors. Uh, we're going to take a look at what, what we mean with heterogeneous computing and the approach that we're going to be using today, believe it or not, is OpenMP. So we're going to go back to, to this good friend of us because it's very friendly indeed, uh, OpenMP. And if we have time, we may comment and compare with other approaches or languages, All right? And again, feel free to, to ask questions. Um, so we, we saw this uh, since a couple of weeks now how to tackle programming, parallel programming on what we call hybrid architectures, meaning you have nodes that are composed by cores. These cores are all the same. So these compute units are all the same. And then you, you connect these this nodes, the different um, individual elements in the cluster by, by interconnect, a high speed interconnect. And the approach that we have been using in the last week is, okay, for, for dealing with the uh, identical computing units within the node, we can use OpenMP for dealing with uh, computations distributed 
across the cluster on different nodes. We use MPI, as you will be doing on, on your last assignment. And if you want to combine um, the approaches, as, as Francis uh, showed last time, you can use a hybrid approach, meaning combining MPI and OpenMP. Okay, and this is, this is mostly what you guys have learned and we have been discussing in the last lectures. What we're going to be talking today is about this picture, is where our nodes are not only composed by uh, these identical compute units, meaning the cores on the, on the CPU side, but also uh, with an additional device. Let's call it device in general. This device can be, or the most common ones are actually CPUs, which are graphic processing units, or GP, GPU for general purpose graphic processing units. And we also have, or may have, uh, what we call coprocessors. These are the specialized uh, devices which are only full of, of processing units, of computing processing units. An example of this is a Xeon 5. This was a couple of years ago, maybe four or five years ago, it was, it was a big trend. Uh, I believe that is not much the case, but you may still find systems where, where there are some, some of these Xeon files. They are called coprocessors because they are not the main processor of the, of the computer, but they are very similar on architecture. And we're going to see a little bit of this. Now, any of these devices, I'm going to be referring to this as, I will use different synonyms, uh, uh, accelerator devices, are, are what we call the specialized and super threaded meaning that you can run of the order of hundreds up to thousand threads, okay? Even 50,000 threads in the CM5 or things like that. Um, so machines with CPU are typically considered machine with multiple cores. The tricky part here is that the amount of memory that these devices have is limited. And it's not as much as the main memory of the hosting device. So we're going to differentiate this terminology as well between host and device. Um, the other caveat here is, okay, you may have heard, if, if, if you pay attention to high performance computing or supercomputing trends, that everyone is in love with um, accelerators or GPUs and, and everyone thinks, okay, this is the way to go. Most of the national labs in the States have systems where they are populated mostly with this type of architectures. And the truth to be told is, Yes, in some cases you can get a lot of speed up factors, but the truth is there is a price to pay. And the price to pay is that usually you end up with a specialized programming languages such as CUDA, OpenCL, or some not so specialized languages uh, or what we call directive programming languages like OpenMP or, no, or OpenACC. Also, the interesting fact is that nowadays we can use, or especially if you want to use this device across the cluster, you will need to combine one of these specialized languages, CUDA or OpenCL plus MPI. So the communication through the uh, interconnect will still have to be done through MPI. And you can start to see how complicated this thing is. Um, now, the, the, the good news, relatively good news, as I mentioned, is that some directly driven languages when I mean directly driven languages are, are languages such as, or not languages, but um, declarations uh, that the compilers allow us to use, such as OpenMP, can nowadays target these accelerator devices. And that is what we're going to be, that's the main focus of the class today. So OpenMP alone can be used within the node to offload computations to the accelerator or CPU or, or, or coprocessor if you wish, okay? Ah, Baran, which language is for the game makers? Um, we always get this question when we talk about accelerators. I believe, uh, I used to know this one. Um, okay, let me see if, my, if I can recall. I, uh, it's escaping me now. My, my cousin, he's a game developer, and we always had a conversation about that, but now it's, it's escaping me. I don't want to tell you a name because I don't recall from the top of... Yeah, OpenShell is more for the graphic side, I believe. Um, but I think there is another one which uh, I can't I can recall now. I know because this conversation I have had with my cousin is um, some people still use um, C or C++. Gaming programming is a lot about objects, right? It's, it's the main, I, I believe one of the main forces behind object-oriented programming was game developing. 
Um, but yeah, that mean, that's exactly what they're going to say. There is a lot of engines where you can offload things right? from fluid dynamics. Uh, let's say you are developing a game where there is shooting and there is splash of blood. So there is a lot, a lot of engines where you basically offload everything to the engine, to, to this sort of libraries and everything is done behind the scenes. So don't, don't be surprised if you see a lot of things with C++ because uh, as I say, many things can be of uh, to the engine. If I don't remember by the end of today, I, I post something in the photos because uh, it's somewhere over here, but probably in the very back of my mind. So I apologize about that, okay? Um, okay, so let's, let's just recap a little bit. This parallel term, these are the parallel techniques that we have seen, OpenMP for shared memory systems, um, using basically compiler detectives, as I mentioned, MPI is for distributed systems, uh, it's explicit message puzzle library. But there are other options, and I'm not going to die too much on them, but I would like still to mention a few of them. So for accelerators, and these are a few examples, she, uh, GPUs, C on files, FPGAs, these are uh, field programmable gate arrays. These are very interesting devices. We can have a conversation in parallel about them. Um, for this, the main languages that you will see people using is CUDA, uh, which is very targeted to GPUs. The bad side of CUDA is that it's proprietary by NVIDIA, meaning that you basically can program in CUDA uh, uh, NVIDIA GPUs, not AMD GPUs. OpenACC and OpenCL. OpenCL is very low le uh, level. Basically, you, you will be doing handshaking with the hardware, uh, but this is it basically is a standard that whatever device has a standard, uh, an accordance of a standard for OpenCL, it will work, and it's most, most of devices have at a certain level. And then OpenMP. And when I mean OpenMP, most of the features we're going to be seeing today, well, all the features that we're going to see today R for OpenMP greater or equal four. Some of them are for 4.5. Some of them are for five. Um, and I believe the current version is 5.1. Now, OpenMP, as you know, are detective for the compiler. And this means that even when uh, we, we have a standard with the OpenMP forum, uh, some things will work better with some compilers and some things will work better with other compilers. Okay, so we may, may have a small discussion about that. Then there are different approaches. Uh, I just put them here for, for complementary sake, uh, but we're not going to be talking about any of them today. Okay. So, so what is heterogeneous computing? Well, the, the idea of heterogeneous computing, as I mentioned at the beginning, is to use different compute devices concurrently in the same computation. And different means that, again, think about uh, within a, a node computation, you can have CPUs, you can have cores, which are all identical, but then you can have one of these devices hosted by the, by the node. And then that is what it makes uh, heterogeneous in contrast to homogeneous. Um, the idea here, for instance, is that you can leverage the CPU for general computing components, components and use the CPUs for data rate parallel or flop intensive components. And we are going to see why this is this is advantage. Now the, the, the pros are that in principle can be faster and cheap in terms of uh, the dollar value per float per watt uh, computation. Um, the, the cons is that definitely it's a little bit more complicated to program than just with homogeneous devices, with homogeneous computing. So a little bit of, of terminology, I mentioned this CP, CPU stands for general purpose graphic processing unit. Host is what we refer to the CPU and, and its memory. So within the node, uh, the CPUs and the main memory is what it will be referred to, to, to host. And then device can be the accelerator, in this case, the CP, CPU and, and its memory or, or the coprocessor or the FPGA if you, if you have one of those, okay? So that a little bit of terminology there. Now, I, I, I told you we, we are going to, to look a little bit at the architecture of these devices because this is what in principle determine the way to program them, but also the advantages that we can, we can get from, from using them. So usually systems with accelerators are machines which contain an off-host uh, accelerator, as we mentioned, the CPU or the CM5. And, and here you are seeing what we call these target devices, the Intel Xeon Phi, 
um, and then the, the, the CPU. We're going to see this, this scheme in, a, in more detail, but just to, to get an idea, what happened here is within these devices, you will find many, many cores. And we say that you can even have of the order of thousand or, or, or several thousand um, threads, which won't surprise you to have many, many cores, thousand cores in some cases. And associated to this course, we talk a little bit about this during the, during the course, there will be some level of memory, but not at all the same amount or comparable amounts to the main memory in the, in the hosting device. So usually you get, for instance, this is a very, very, in particular for the C on file, you get a level of L2 cache close to the course, then you get some, some um, interchangeable or switchable uh, memory banks, but not much more than that. And we're going to see how this, this is represented in the CPU, but it's a very similar picture where you will see. It's even, it's even more dramatic because the, the level of cache is shared across lines in the CPU. So that is why at some point, the stagnation point in this kind of, of computations is the memory bandwidth of the communication of data between the host and the device. Um, I mentioned this, the type of programming model is, is the ones given by CUDA, OpenSCC, and OpenCL, and OpenMP, as we're going to, to, to see today. So when we combine these host devices uh, with the, with the sorry, the host plus the devices, is when we refer to a heterogeneous computing. And something that I, wish, I should say is, it's is not possible to just um, launch a computation in a, in a device without sending it through the host. So you, anytime you want to use any of these technologies, you need to start your computation on the host. Ergo, you, you are always talking about heterogeneous computing in these in this, in this cases, okay? Now, let's, uh, any, any questions so far? Okay, let's dive a little bit then into the, the CPU, which again, it reflects a little bit uh, the, the comments I did for the for the C on five, but most in most in most of the systems now I will be, I will say we are talking about devices composed by CPUs and not accelerate not coprocessors. So that's why I, I I will focus more in this comparison. So what we have on the top is is the typical core or CPU architecture where you have you will have the uh, control unit and then the arithmetic and logic units. And this represents the multiple, multiple cores, if you wish, within the node. Then you will have a, a good amount of cache, a substantial amount of cache, and then the main memory, if you wish. Now, that's the picture that you see in a CPU. The picture that you will see in a CPU is, okay, you have some memory accessible by all the cores. But then what is, is, uh, is a stagnation point is you will have the control units but most of the, com of the components on the CPU are, are compute units, are arithmetic and logic units. And that is where the magic happens for, for improving a lot the number of computations that you can run in parallel in these devices. Now, notice that many of these lanes share the same control unit, but also the same cache. So these red boxes are tiny amount of memory that are shared. So in other words, you gain by having a lot of workers for you, but with very tiny memory banks or cache banks or cache lines, as you wish. So in general, the CPUs are for general purpose. They, they can achieve good performance with task parallelism. They maximize the serial performance. They have large cache. Uh, they can have multi-threads, order of four to 16, depending on, on, on the architecture. And they have some SIMID uh, or SIMD, uh, which stands for single instruction, multiple data. This is the main concept of vectorization, if you wish. If you have a vector and you have an operation like um, sum, then you can perform all, all the elements, or you have two vectors, you can perform the sum of element wise in one single instruction. Now on the CPU side, for just putting things in, in, in concrete, um, these are target for data parallelism with one single task. Uh, the idea here is to maximize the throughput because you can have all these units computing at the same time. And as I mentioned, they will have a very small cache. These are what we call super threaded. I, I mentioned this order of 100 to 1,000 or 10,000 of, of threads. 
And because of that, they are also called streaming multiprocessors. You will see this, this terminology also in the field, streaming multiprocessors, because you have these processors and, and they can be streaming computations. And almost all of them are single instruction, multiple data. Okay, so this is just in, uh, to keep in mind the main difference between the architecture. And because of this, we are going to have different, different ways to, to program and handle the computation. Now, let's go back a little bit. This is going to be a very quick slide. I, I just want to, to refresh you or, or, or recall this execution model of OpenMP where we had the initial master thread and then the master thread come and throw or spawn um, uh, other threads. And then you can have parallel regions and nested parallel regions. There was an interesting discussion, I believe, in, in Monday or yesterday office hours talking about these nested parallel regions. The important element I want to to emphasize here is this concept of themes. And we haven't used much the concept of theme yet in, in the OpenMP uh, programming model, but this is going to be a, a key element when we are offloading computation with OpenMP into these accelerators. And the idea here is that a theme is composed by a master plus workers. Okay, so bear that in mind, as I say, very quick slide. The, 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 uh, the paradigm that was introduced in OpenMP4 uh, expanded on Open, OpenMP 4.5 and continue in OpenMP 5 is this idea of supporting target themes and distribute another construct that we're going to be seeing today. So the idea here is that in the same way that um, we can spawn threads across uh, equal cores or similar cores in the host, we can do that with the devices. And again, this is the same picture I was showing you before with this device plus the host. And, and the host basically is the share uh, address of memory. And then you have the operating system running on top of that. You have your processors, you have your cache line associated with that. But then you may have an OpenMP runtime library. That's something we're going to, to need. And then direct this to the compiler, calls to the OpenMP libraries, as we saw in some cases, environment variables that will determine how many threads, for instance, are going to be spawned and then your application or end user uh, program. And that is the, the way it will build upon and, and be able to access the devices and offload computation to the device. Now, some of the relevant features that allow us to, to do this with OpenMP are the following, and we're going to see examples of, of at least one of them, as you can imagine, is, is, is it's a huge, amount of, of uh, new things that can be done when, when we are talking about these, these devices. But the most relevant ones, I would say, are target directives. Uh, this is the ones that actually provide support for accelerators. Tasking directives. This allow us to do uh, asynchronous programming. Um, and, and we're going to see why this could be interesting. Loop, direct, loop directives for word sharing. Uh, this is to support multi-cores and accelerators at the same time. Then the SIMD directives, so these are to support a single instruction, multiple data parallelism, which is, is, is one crucial element. If not so much on, 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 on the CPU, the traditional CPU side, it is indeed on the, on the accelerator's work. Thread affinity, I think we had at some point a discussion about this during the lectures. Um, and then of course, extended runtime APIs uh, allow you to uh, inquire about uh, which thread I am, uh, device memory routines, et cetera. There is a, now, the, the very, I think I mentioned this uh, very quickly, but a very important element here is because this is all, draw, all done through directives from the compiler, it depends a lot on which compiler support this. And this is complicated, that's, that's, <laughs> that's the reality. There is no way to, to hide this because some compilers are better, better suited to handle some things and some compilers are better suited to handle some hardware. Um, so it's so complicated that actually OpenMP keeps a list of the, of the compilers that support these directives. And, and if you're interested and if you're thinking of going down this, this way, uh, I invite you to look at them because some compilers are, are, are better for doing some things and some compilers are better for, the, for doing other things. And some compilers will work better with a particular hardware while others will work better with, with, with other ones, okay? I don't want to mention the names, but if you guys are interested, I, I, I could give some examples. Um, 
So let's revisit this, this execution model. Now, bearing in mind this idea of, of, of loading things to, to the accelerators. So these are four key uh, constructs, that's the terminology or, or keywords that you can use with the OpenMP pragmas or OpenMP directives to be more formal. So the target construct, what happened is, is going to offload all the computations or the given computations into the accelerator. The teams construct will create a league of teams. Basically, what happened now is, and I'm going to show you a, a, a diagram in a second, making contact to what we saw before. But now we are going to have this a logical, but also related to the, to the physical hardware, units of multiple workers. And finally, the parallel construct will create a new team of threads. And if you want to use the same delays, which are these, these lines that I was showing you in the, in the hardware uh, uh, diagram, uh, you can use the same deconstruct. So how it works in reality is, okay, you have this, this the, the, the CPU or the host, you will have your accelerator attached to that, to that uh, host, the device. And within the device, you will have this, um, these teams, if you wish, that they can be created. And within these teams, we can have these, these threads. And now you can also group these threads in what we call warps or subwarps. Now, how this works in, in, in contrast to how we were doing things before, well, the Pragma opening P parallel that we use in, in, in assignment nine and in some of our previous examples, what does is it launches these M threads. Now the picture, as you can see, is a little bit more, more complicated. It has a little bit more of layers because the first things that we need to do is to uh, issue this Pragma open MP target telling the, com the, the compiler, okay, this part of the computation will be shipped to the, to the device, the accelerator or the CPU. And then within the device, I want to create a team of workers. And within those team of workers, then I can issue my OpenMP parallel that will create M threads, but you can have at the same time M teams of these workers. And you can bind them together, uh, these threads, using the CMD uh, construct if needed. Okay. Again, the, the ideas are kind of the same. There is a little more of, of, of uh, intermediate steps, but this is to take full advantage of the hardware, which is different from the hardware that we have in a typical CPU or core. Okay, I know that it, this may sound a little bit up on the air yet, but we're going to see a few examples, how it compares, how, how we do some things in the old way we do it, uh, we did it, and, and how we will do it for an accelerator. Now, one more important thing is, um, let, me, let me talk about this target device, the construct, because it's, it's the one that actually uh, allow you to move the computation into the accelerator. So basically, it's, it's an implementation defined, uh, what we call a device is an implementation defined, it can be logical or an execution unit or accelerator. The key element here is the device data environment is the storage associated with this device. And again, this is independent from the memory in the host. So the execution model, as I was mentioning at the beginning, is, is host centric, me meaning that you cannot just start your program on the device. It has to start on the host and then offload to the device. So that means that the host will create and destroy data environments on the device. It means that the host is responsible for, for mapping the data uh, to the device. Uh, the host is also responsible for offloading OpenMP target regions into the device, updating the data between these, these devices, and, and basically to, to, to offload to an initial device. Uh, it can be also a, a CPU if you wish. Now, uh, how, how this target construct works? Well, it basically will transfer the control to the host, the, from the host to the device. The syntax is, is as we saw before, it has a pragma, open MP target, and then there are a couple of clause, and then you can structure a block, basically a code block. And the closest can be device, can be map, and we're going to see what map means, and then can be some conditional if needed. Um, the idea here is that the target construct is used to transfer the control of the host to, to the target device and also to map variables. And with map, I mean moving data from the host to the device and vice versa. Now, this is the part that is also different from the usual way we, we use OpenMP before because OpenMP for us was a shared memory approach. But now because we have a different device 
um, connected to our host, that memory sharing is not there. So we need to take care of that. It's still not MPI per se, because the, the communication is not messages per se, it's the actual data that is moved from one device into the other. And we are going to see some examples of this. Now, um, because of this data part, which is so relevant, we need to talk about the data regions. So the map clause, which is another of the, of the construct that you can use with this new way of using MP, OpenMP, determine how an original and initial device uh, is seen in, in a data environment, map it to a correspondable, uh, corresponding device in the, in the, sorry, corresponding variable in the device uh, data environment. So the idea is we're going to have a variable in our host. We are going to have to move it to the device to perform computations, and then we need to bring it back. Okay, so it's, it's a little bit of, of, of a tedious thing. Now, this picture is evolving. What I mean with this is this was the picture that we have for OpenMP4 and OpenMP4.5. For OpenMP5, you have something called unified memory, where I'm going to show you an example. But again, bear in mind, this, these are not for free operations. They, they have some, some costs associated to it, OK? So um, let me see if we can, how much time? Uh, there are many different ways you can do this, this mapping of the, of the data and the variables. Uh, the PRAMA will look something uh, like this. Uh, and this is a generic PRAMA. It's a PRAMA, OpenMP, target, the data, and then the map. And what it means is the two is allocates data, moves data to the device from, means bring the data back from the device to, to the host. You can also use a two from, which allocates data, moves data to and from the device. And then you can have control on delete and release. Okay, so the, the release is more a thing for the synchronization purposes, which also you have to take care of control uh, of that uh, if, if, if needed, depending on the computation. Again, this is a little bit of theory behind. We're going to see some examples, but do let me know if you if you have some any questions or something is not clear so far. I guess many of these things are still very, very up in the air because I haven't see, uh, show you yet an example, but we're going to see that in a second. All right. So let's start with one of our old approaches to OpenMP. Uh, and here what I have is a, is a homogeneous implementation or, or CPU implementation of nothing else than um, a, a multiplication of a vector by a scalar in addition to another vector. Nothing too profound, but, but uh, enough to, to see how this works. So the way that we used to do uh, the parallelization with OpenMP was to include the Pragma OpenMP parallel for, and then the for loop was basically parallelized in M threads. Now, this is one, one thing that is relatively new or that you can do here with, with the scene lanes is add this SIMD uh, construct. What happened here is depending on the combination, and this is where things get not complicated, but a little bit not so trivial, I would say, is depending on the combination of compiler hardware, you may get benefits by using the SIMD construct or not. And that's something you need to experiment and something that depending on which system you're running, people has, has already um, figured this out. But it's something that you need to be aware of, okay? Now, how we translate this into a code that targets um, and, and, and uh, a device, what we call offload to the device. Well, the pragma will convert to something like pragma OpenMP. We need the target construct because we, want now, we now want to, to offload this to the device. We want to create some things. And then what we want is to distribute the computation in, in the parallel for loop. And again, the same the instruction, which here is between brackets, it doesn't mean that the notation is like that. It means that you can have it or not. Okay, so this is our first translation of an OpenMP program that will run in an homogeneous system, meaning just simple cores or multiple cores with shared memory approach and uh, a program that will be running on, on, on a device hosted by a homogeneous system. Okay, so it's a little bit more verbose, the parameters, but there still is something that is not too, too convoluted, I would say. Now, let me go back to this example and what actually may happen because I'm just showing you a snippet of a code, basically the for loop. What will happen in reality 
uh, with this OpenMP approach is that in general, before the parallelization of the computations, you will need to do some data handling, meaning moving the data from the CPU to the device, perform the computations and bring it back. How we do that? Well, let's say that uh, we have these, these vectors A and B, those A, A will store the result of the calculation, B is um, the original vector. So let's say I want to, uh, and I'm forgetting C here, but, but C will be also need to be moved. What I will do first is pram up an MP target because this has to go to the device, data and map to the device, the vector A, the vector B, and I will have the vector C as well. Then the calculation in parallel performed in the device will be OpenMP target teams distribute parallel four with CMD or not CMD construct. And then my for loop for uh, the multiplication the, of the scalar times the vector plus another vector. Now, when my, when my calculation is done, when my calculation is done on the device, what I need is to bring the result storing the vector A to the host. And that I will do with prime map and MP targets, a date from and the vector, the vector I want to, to bring back. Okay, so this is the general thing that you will see. Now, there are a lot of things I not, I'm not diving into. For instance, what is the memory of the device? If I have a very large array, will it fit in memory? Those things are the things that start to get complicated when we talk about heterogeneous computing. And those things, at least with this approach I'm showing you right now, the programmer has to take full control of them. Okay? And so it's not unheard of cases where your calculation crashes because the device ran out of memory, right? So any questions about this? Okay. So, I told you we need to take care of moving the data, but there are some cases where the data transfer is implicit. So we're going to see a case where the data offload or, or transfer between the host and device is implicit, and another case where it has to be explicitly taken care of, of, of it, okay? So in this case, is just we're defining a, a, a vector of n square values and initializing somehow that's the initialization. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, just launch my, my target region. So I'm going to flow whatever comes after this structured block to the device. And because <clears throat> there is nothing determined, OpenMP will implicitly move the data between the host and the device. So X mapped to and from uh, the device. One thing to bear in mind is that the, the scalars are, are referred to or are transferred as uh, what they are called first private, meaning that they remain private to, to, to the nested loops uh, regions. What comes after is just launching the, the, the teams. So pram up and MP teams distribute, and then the for loop uh, for doing the computation and then launching different number of threads. So basically doing the calculation in this case is, is just doing some, some calculation. It doesn't really matter what happens here. Um, and that's the idea. So because in this particular case, because um, this is a vector, it's, it's automatically or is uh, implicitly uh, transferred by the, by the OpenMP constructs uh, to the device, okay? Now, a different case, a different case is, for instance, when we are dealing with pointers. So if instead of dealing this array as an automatic array, you, you handle it as a pointer to an array. Uh, and this is a little bit, one thing I, I, I should mention, when you start to see this kind of, of programming styles, you will start to see that people get more close or more, how to say, um, comfortable perhaps with a C style than C++. So you won't start to see this uh, MLog log things for, for um, allocating memory for your arrays, uh, something that we also saw in the, in the course. But basically we are, we are here defining a pointer to, to the array. Now, if you want to work with the pointer and the calculation is exactly the same or very similar to what we saw before, now instead of waiting for OpenMP to do the implicit transfer of the data, we do have to uh, take control of, of, of this. So the way that we do it is in this case, 
we issue the OpenMP target map to and from to the uh, to the device and from the device back to the host of of this array defined by by the pointer to the array. Okay, the calculation continues as, as in the same ways as before with the things distribute parallel for, but the data transfer has to be explicit. All right. Any questions about this? So there are cases where, as usual, right? There are cases where things will work just as they are expected by this uh, 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 implicit way of transferring. There are cases where you want to take full control of, of this. The case of running out of memory is a case where even if you use or not pointers, you may want to have full control limited by, by, the, by the hardware that you are using, by the accelerator, by the memory of the accelerator in particular, because you want to handle those cases, uh, you know, case by case, or, or depending on the amount of memory that you use. So those are also cases where where one has to do the, the data transfer uh, explicitly. Um, oh, this is an interesting one. In some cases, um, depending again on the calculation, you can you can um, use the target update construct which basically kept things updated. Now, again, there is no free lunch here. That will imply at some point in your calculation that there are synchronization processes launched and then, you know, a, a price to pay in terms of performance. But if you are doing a lot of calculation uh, computations in the, in the device, then it may be something worth exploring. Okay, so instead of doing, so one thing that I'm, I, I'm doing here is map to from, I could do something like map uh, sorry, open MP target update and then and then keep things synchronized sort of. Now I mentioned this. Um, this this idea of transferring data between the host and the device is new in the OpenMP shared memory approach because it's no more shared memory approach. But OpenMP5, starting on OpenMP5, and I, and I think the latest version is OpenMP5.1. Has this idea of unified virtual memory support, and the idea is that, well, as the name says, you are trying to unify the memory between the host and the device by not having the programmer uh, taking control of this, but actually the compiler and and the libraries within or or the APIs within uh, the OpenMP directory. So the idea is that you will see or the program will see a single address space over the CPU and GPU memories. This is also, I, I should say, this is also driven in part because hardware improvements, let's put it in that way. So vendors and, 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 and hardware manufacturers had developed new technologies that allow to communicate between the device and the host in a much more smoother way and, and, and in increasing the bandwidth of the communication. So each vendor has, again, this is, the terrain where we get into the nasty details of the implementations, even the hardware implementations. So each vendor has his own approach. Uh, at least there are two big ones. And depending on what approach you, you use, some things work better with one or the other. And that's why the combination of hardware compilers is, is, is relevant here as well. But independent of that, the, the trend in OpenMP5 is to start allowing programs to use this uh, unified virtual memory support. But it's very straightforward to use. It's very, very appealing if you wish. Um, data will be migrated between the CPU and GPU memory is transparent to the application. So no need to explicitly copy data or move data back and forth. The way that you will ta uh, prompt this is by using Pragma OpenMP requires unified shared memory. This will at the same time trigger a set of checks to know if the hardware allows you to do that and the compilers allow you to do that. And of course, the directive has to be up to the version where, where uh, is, is uh, supported. And in this case, if you do that, then things are very, very similar to just OpenMP, usual OpenMP plus the targets and the team, but then it's just a parallel for uh, loop construct. Okay, so I wanted to mention this because it's something that is coming and in many cases you can use it depending on the hardware again and the compiler. Uh, another thing that you can do, uh, and this again is where things start to get interesting for some people, uh, but also is a little bit of, um, you know, a, a steeper uh, process or learning curve if you wish, is to combine OpenMP and CUDA. So if you are, if you know a little bit about CUDA, you, and this is starting to be, you know, 
at least it's possible starting on, on OpenMP 4.5, is you can do CUDA calls for allocating, for instance, in this case, I'm allocating uh, memory on the device, CUDA MLOC manage, allow you to allocate memory on the, on the CPU, and then three, three vectors or three pointers as you wish. And then basically you, you launch your, your teams, you distribute the work, and then each device pointer is the ones that allow you to actually access those, those uh, memory references within the device. Then the for loop is, as, as usual, is the same example I was showing you uh, just a few slides ago about the scalar vector multiplication. Okay, but something that is also possible, you can even uh, combine CUDA and OpenMP if you wish. At some point, depend, many things you, you, you have heard me say depends on other things. And, and that's the truth, right? It depends what level of intimacy you want to gain with the hardware, but you will have to uh, at some point, depending on, again, depending on what type of computation, what type of performance you also want to achieve. So just a quick wrap up about OpenMP. Um, my first uh, disclose here is that by any means, this can be considered a, even a, a, an introduction to OpenMP. It's just, it's just a, an advertising, if you wish, to some OpenMP features in heterogeneous computing. It's a, it's a whole new world um, dealing with these things because most of the concepts that we are familiar in OpenMP has to be, uh, if not, you know, abandoned, they has to be mutated into something new and it has to be, it has to be reconsidered some others. So some of the important uh, constructs that OpenMP offers are the targets and the clear target. This is basically offloading the, the code to be run on the device. Then the management of the data environments with the map and data and updates uh, constructs. All of these are basically related to moving data back and forth between the devices and something that in, in general, I would say is something expected to, to do. Um, then parallelism and work share between the devices, that's when you can launch things and distribute the work between your different uh, workers. Um, as usual, we will have also runtime routines. So things to uh, OpenMP get a number of threads or, or, or the thread ID, those kind of things are still available and a few more. And also the number of environment variables are, are, are a little bit larger than in the, in the OpenMP homogeneous programming approach because there are more things to, to, to bear in mind. So each of these boxes here is, is a, new, a new chapter that you can, you can learn about for, for the OpenMP. Now, um, let me see, we, we still have a few minutes. So I just want to mention this. There is a very similar approach, or uh, well, I don't know if I call it similar approach. Let me, let me explain what I mean with similar approach or in which, in which means I, I, I meant similar approach. Uh, is in the sense that there is a, a directed programming approach, let's put it in that way, basically uh, instructions given by, by this must, which is OpenACC. OpenACC was mostly developed, I think, in about accelerators in particular, things like the uh, coprocessors, like the Intel Xeon 5. And, and I think they, they, they were pushed for, for a few years. Now, I don't know how much is the push, but they're still around. And again, depending on the hardware, you may be, you may be um, in good path using it. Uh, but this is a, a comparison. This is the same code in, in written in OpenMP and OpenACC. And some translation has to be done. So what we call targets and things in OpenMP uh, is what uh, OpenACC call gangs and worker vector terminology, if you wish, is you were launching one of these offloading to the device and launching your workers on your target things in, in, in the device. You will use something like Pram OpenMP, things distribute the parallel for and CD in some cases. Well, this translates in the, in the ACC terminology as a Pragma ACC parallel and a Pragma ACC loop. So these are two different lights, but basically it's the same. They, they, they target the same, uh, the same uh, model of execution. So the same C code that can be seen here, the only changes are in these parameters where basically you define a parallel region, you define a gang worker, and then you, you basically trigger this, this uh, vectorization operations with a uh, parameter ICC vector. So again, this, this directed programming approaches has some appealing 
they are not so difficult to implement. And the, the big advantage is that it can give you quick access to computations on, uh, on the devices, to offload computations to the devices. Again, something that I thought is worth, uh, is worth mentioning just, just to, to put a little bit of what is out there. Um, there are many similarities, as I mentioned, between OpenACC and OpenMP, and you can find this kind of, of, of translation tables uh, just to show how similar some of the concepts are. I, my memory may be failing me, but I would say that OpenMP took a good bunch of ideas from OpenACC. Uh, but again, I'm not, I, I don't want to say or to, to set this in a stone because my memory may be failing me, but I believe OpenACC came with some of these concepts first and then OpenMP, maybe in parallel, maybe inspired by OpenACC also grabbed some of these concepts. But um, as I said, don't, don't, don't quote me on that. All right, so just a quick, a quick uh, summary of what we saw today. There are several advantages or, 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 or things are quite appealing to this directive-based parallelism. And some of them are what, what Francis already mentioned in his OpenMP lectures is the incremental parallel programming approaches in the sense that you can start with your serial call, uh, sorry, serial call uh, with a single source code for sequential parallel programs and then uh, use compiler flags to enable or disable these features. So your, your you know, code that can be offloaded to the device can be also run on the host without offloading anything. Um, so there is no major overwrite of the serial code uh, if you wish. They will work both on CPU and CPUs. Uh, the, the learning curve, I would say, is slow compared to approaches like MPI or CUDA or OpenCL if we are talking about accelerators. And you don't need to worry much about the lower level hardware details, although it's good to have an idea of how things work in comparison to a CPU approach. Um, with respect to portability, there are some things that will, as I mentioned, I try to, to exemplify this with the SIMD construct. Some things will work better for certain combination of compiler hardware, and some things will not work as, as good but your code will work. It's, it's a little bit about performance, but you guys by now, by now you, you should know that um, what is the best performance depends on different things. And at the end of the day is, is profiling and, and measurement what we had to do in order to understand what combination is the best. Um, so just a quick, uh, a quick uh, couple of references. If you are interested in, in, in learning more about OpenMP and, and direct, directive-based programming for, for accelerators, these two are really good um, materials of reference. I took some of, of the concepts and ideas and even examples from, from these two tutorials. Um, in particular, the EP, EPC is the Exascale Project uh, for Computing or Exascale Parallel Computing uh, Project. is is, is an initiative in the stage by the combination of different national labs and it has really good amount of resources. There is even a Git repository that you can clone with many different examples. But now again, bear in mind, because we are still at the level of needing to be intimate with the, with the hardware, um, you, need, you will need to tweak things to make it work. Needless to say, the Teach cluster is, <laughs> doesn't have any CPUs, no accelerators, so I don't have any, any working example for that. But if you are a Niagara user or a Signet user and you have access to MIS or any of the GP systems on the Compute Canada clusters, then you can, you can try things there with OpenMP and OpenACC. Okay, so that's, that's also an interesting thing to, to bear in mind. Um, okay, so we are almost on time. I have just one more slide as a recap of the course, but I would like to know if there are any questions about uh, this so far. That's right, Veran, that's right. So in this particular, in this particular cases are just for one um, accelerator. Um, if you want to use more, you need to use MPI. So, you will need to be doing something like MPI plus OpenMP or MPI plus CUDA or MPI plus um, OpenACC. I just doubt in a little bit because it's possible, I, I don't recall from the top of my head, maybe Rancis knows better, uh, is OpenMP5 
allow you to, to do something like that without requiring MPI. But in principle, I would say no, but you know what, it's something I, 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 I may need to double check. Okay, no problem. All right, so if, if you got things about any other questions, please let me know. Just a very quick course recap. What we saw in this um, in this um, in these weeks, I can't remember how many weeks now. Um, I think twelve weeks, something like that. Twelve weeks were were mostly three different main components. Um, we saw best practices in scientific computing, version control, modular programming, unit testing, debugging, and we spent a good amount of time talking about file I/O and standardized file formats such as NetCDF. Um, we talk about libraries a good amount of, of time as well. And we saw different libraries that you can use different solutions for, for different problems. And the last part of the course was mostly about to high performance computing by looking uh, into things like profiling, performance metrics, clusters and scheduler of supercomputing, and then OpenMP, MPI, and then we came back to OpenMP. My last comment is if you haven't uh, taking the time yet to complete the survey, the, the course evaluation that is run by the university, please, please, please uh, do so. It's, it's, you can believe how important it is for that, uh, is for us that, uh, because it provides a lot of insights of things that worked for us and things that didn't work and things that we can improve. And unfortunately we are living in, 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 in very weird times, <laughs> let me say it that way. And in other cases, we'll, we will have the pleasure to meet each of you, or at least most of you, in person. So, um, you know, when things get back to normal, don't hesitate to, to stop by our offices. We are, we are a downtown campus, so we will be very much in, 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 in happiness of meeting each of you. Um, but don't hesitate to also drop us an email if you have any questions or concerns. I and mean, of course, we may still see you during office hours. Um, and yeah, so I think Rancis got a question or a, a, an answer for Beran. Oh, right. Yes. Okay. That's, that's true. You can target the different devices, but yeah. And the communication is going to be done through the host. I was thinking that, yeah, that's right. That's right. You, you can target the different devices that way. I was thinking a more complex picture, but that's, that's an easy way to, to do it. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you everyone for, for the nice comments, by the way. Uh, let me, I'm going through the comments questions, if there is any question. Okay, thank you everyone for the comments, that's very really good. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm going through the comments, trying to find questions. Is the same intent, the last assignment of the course? Uh, Alvin, yes, it is. Um, the caveat there is, is uh, you, uh, you need to have 10 submitted assignments. So if you miss one assignment for whatever reason, uh, you need to do an additional assignment that is going to be posted next Thursday, so a week from now. And it's going, going to have a period of, of one week to submit the assignment. You can also submit, we call that the makeup assignment. You can also submit that makeup assignment if you feel that you would like to improve your grade, but please bear in mind that what that makeup assignment does is it offers a pool of 11 or, or 10 depending, and, and, and we took the best 10. So it only improves one, one data point. So if your data points or your guys are good enough, you really don't need to do it unless you want to try. Um, Okay, did I miss anything? Okay. All right, guys. So I think um, if there are no more questions, then that is it for today. We're still going to have the office hours next week. And again, feel free to, to reach to us by email or, or the forum, okay? Oh, yes, uh, Wilson, quick question. Yep. 
Uh, wait, why does integer overflow happen? Integer overflow. Okay, so what happened there is we didn't. We usually have. <laughs> it's a good question. We usually have um, a lecture on what we call numerics. I, I, I think this question has come in different contexts, but I can put a, a reference on the forum to previous year's lectures. What happened is, imagine that you have a variable that allow you to allocate uh, a particular integer size, and, and then your value is larger than that. So what will happen is the, the memory allocated for that variable will, will not have enough space to represent the number that you want. Um, the technicality has to, be, has to deal with how we represent number in computers, but basically think about, okay, if I have only X number of bytes to represent a number, but that number requires more bytes because it's larger than the maximum amount of, of, of representable, but that overflow means Usually you see this represented as uh, in a cyclic way, like if the number goes beyond that maximum representable, re starts um, again, if, if, if this is something that happens to you or concerns you, I, I'm happy to share some type of, we call numerical errors, but it should be more called like numerical representation limitations, sort of like that, because every single number that we represent in, in a computer has, has a type associated to it, at least in, in, in this type of programming languages, has a type associated to it. When we define a particular type in, in, in C or Fortran or C++, that type sticks to the variable. And then if you're trying to, you know, represent and represent given a number of bytes, and again, it's related to how we represent numbers on computers. Um, and if you run, if, if such a quantity is smallest, then that is, can be interpreted as null, even when it is not null. So there is a whole family of this type of errors. Okay, right, thank I you. I hope that, that answered more or less your question, but again, feel free to, to drop yeah, us a little bit yeah. on the following issue yeah. if you need more information, okay? okay. Thank you. No problem. Um, okay. Okay, so questions about the assignment probably we can take. Um, offline or, or by email or in a private. All right. Thank you, everyone. We will see you next week.